Hello, 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 everyone. Good evening, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julian Saunders. I'm the author or co-author, I should say, of the forthcoming book, Cashing Out. Um, I am a blogger, content creator, and entrepreneur, uh, but that is all I will say about myself tonight uh, or this evening, depending on what part of the country or the world you're in, is really all about my friend and the wonderful author, Tanya Hester. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Tanya for a few years. Uh, in my head, I've actually known her far longer because I'm sure, like many of you, you've been reading her work or listening to her on her podcast or listening to her being interviewed on someone else's podcast. She is, without question, and I believe one of the most brilliant minds um, within several spaces, whether we're talking about politics or personal finance, uh, but in this case, we're talking about her new book, wallet activism all right i'm sure if you don't have it already uh, i would advise you use the button right there uh, if you're logged in you can get 10 percent off uh, by using the code event uh, at barbara's bookstore um, i've recently just learned that bookshop.org is completely sold out and so this is barbara's bookstore to see if they can catch up and sell out as well so use that code below um, but without further delay um, I want to go ahead and introduce Tanya Hester. How are you, Tanya? I'm great. I, I feel like it's impossible to live up to that introduction, so I think I'm just going to go now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Maybe give us, give us about 30 to 40 more minutes. We've got a couple of questions here, <laughs> uh, and obviously so much uh, that we want to talk about. I am very excited about this book. I cracked it open um, on the flight to Cincinnati, um, and I enjoyed the beginning. I'm going to be on another flight tomorrow morning, and so I will continue that journey into uh, this book. But I would like to start with a very simple question. Um, this is your second book uh, that I know of, um, but I want to ask, really, what inspired you to write Wallet Activism? Yeah, you know, th the truth is that I wrote wallet activism because I wanted to read something like this. And mm. when I went and looked around, nothing like it existed. Uh, there wasn't anything that I felt like was comprehensive about the question of how do you use your money in a way that perhaps does good, but at a minimum doesn't do harm. And that's certainly something that I know many, many of us care about, but it can often be confusing about what the right decision is or whether something we're doing is really just symbolic or performative or to make us feel better rather than actually having an impact. And to be honest, I felt like a lot of the books out there sort of didn't trust me as a reader to be an adult. You know, they, they kind of oversimplified things or sugarcoated things and said, like, here's this one simple thing you can do. And, and you, I think any of us can see through that. You look around, you see, well, we've been recycling for 30 years. Um, have we saved the planet yet? Uh, we haven't. Right. <laughs> so um, that's an example of a message that while good uh, is certainly not sufficient to get to the change we need. And so I wanted to do something where, you know, we, we were willing to all embrace the messiness of our system and our economy together. Um, but still look for that path forward. And so that that was really it is I, I wanted to be able to answer these questions for myself, but figured if I answer them for myself, I'm sure lots of other folks would like this information too. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and, you know, obviously this is a big uh, change or shift from your first book. Um, I know you personally, and so I know that this is actually big secret, the book that you wanted to write the first time. <laughs> uh, so I'm really glad you were able to squeeze this one out. Um, but I do think that there are some parallels. I know we're not here to talk about the first one, but there's always, let's say, the critique um, or the difference between uh, individual choice and the impact that doing that can have on uh, not just your personal life, but um, let's say broader social change or the community. But in this book, you talk about the power of individual choice um, and whether or not it could truly make like a meaningful difference. I'm wondering if you could like elaborate on that and, and like, do you really believe that, right? Like does this ultimately boil down to individual choice or is this a combination of individual choice plus let's say public policy and so on? Could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. You know, I, I think that there are a couple different ways you can think about the power of individual choice. Um, one of them is, I'm sure lots of you have heard the stat that gets thrown around, which is that there are 100 companies in the world that are responsible for 70% of all global climate emissions. And when you look at that, a lot of folks will say, okay, so therefore what I do doesn't matter. Mm. All that matters is regulating those corporations and taking policy action. 
And we need those things. We need to hold corporations accountable. We need to do policy action. But that's not to say that what we do doesn't matter. I, I think this question of collective or individual action is the wrong way to look at it. And really, we should be saying, and, you know, we need to be working on the problems that we're facing from all sides. You know, anything we can do to intervene is powerful. But the biggest thing, and, and this is something where, you know, a big part of the book is teaching people to see through the lies that you're told. And a lot of those lies are told by corporations, but sometimes those lies are even told by environmentalists or people in the social justice space. And so it's it's learning to be more skeptical of that stuff so that you can really think about what's likely to be impactful um, because there, there's just a lot out there that that we believe that isn't actually true. And one of the things is is the lie that we can't be effective as a small number of individuals. But here's something that I, I think is just really, really powerful. So for a lot of years, I worked in politics, as Julian said, and in politics, you have an election and you know if you won or lost, but you have to get to 51% in order to get someone elected. Or sometimes you have to get to 70, 80% of the public wanting something before a policy will get passed. And sometimes not even then. Uh, I think a lot of us would like better climate legislation and we don't have it yet, so we have to keep working on that. But in the corporate space, because we're talking about profits, the bar is actually much, much lower. You know, if you cut somebody's um, market share or share price or profit by 3%, 5%, that's a small number of people needed to do that. But they're going to notice that, you know, and they're going to say, why are we losing customers? Why are we losing money? What are we doing? And that's how a lot of change has happened is, is when customers walked away from something uh, or demanded something, or, or sometimes a few shareholders show up at a at a meeting and demand that the board of directors change their ways. Like that recently happened with ExxonMobil and with Chevron just this past summer of doing shareholder activism. And so when we think about it that way, and you, you understand that, okay, if the corporations are the bad guys and our policymakers won't regulate them as much as we need, we can think about it of our power as customers or consumers or people, you know, just kind of in the world to push them. And, and I really believe that that can be a very fruitful um, avenue. And it's something that's been demonstrated plenty of times. So it's a question of how do we do that in ways that are impactful and not just serving you know, our egos or making us feel good, um, but actually looking at what can we do to make real change. Yeah, I love that you've you've really looked at um, all sides of these particular issues and um, figured out, uh, like I love the idea to your point, I certainly agree with it, the notion that, you know erosion of market share is without question a very powerful force. And it's certainly something that a lot of these corporations um, pay attention to. I know that personally, as a former professional marketer, <laughs> these are the things that really drive funding decisions um, or whether or not you'll enter an entire market or sector to begin with. And so um, thank you for that. Um, I, I just love you really tapping into the intersection of those things. and highlighting at the end of the day what we as consumers and voters uh, can do to really make an impact. Um, I've got another question here I want to ask you and it's around um, your decision to focus on like money and finances um, with your approach to activism uh, as opposed to more direct forms of activism, which I know was you know a big part of your career. Um, so I know obviously they're related, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about that. Yeah, you know, I, I think of direct activism as stuff like marching in the streets and protesting or going to Capitol Hill or your state house and demanding change and writing letters, making phone calls, right. all of that kind of stuff. Um, and that's really important. And I hope folks will do that, too. I felt, though, that that topic was pretty well covered, you know, that there were others out there who'd written really good resources on how to do that. And we've seen in the last five or six years a real increase in the number of people who've been engaged in direct activism. So it didn't feel like an area where it particularly needed my voice <laughs> to say that. Whereas with this stuff, you know, I think that we we so often get stuck in that that conversation of, well, what do my choices matter? And so I don't think that anybody has tried to take this on in this way before because they thought, well, either my choices don't matter or um, let's take these oversimplified actions and folks haven't really taken the big holistic look. And, and frankly, it's because it's a hard topic to write about and it took a lot of research. Um, but I, I think we have tremendous power there. And, and given that we live in a capitalist society in which profits and the, the chase, chasing profits is what leads so many decisions, 
it felt like we can have that conversation too. It's not to say that direct activism isn't important because it absolutely is. But again, just to say we can surround problems from many different angles. And from the work that I did, I saw that time and time again, when change happened, it happened because you had people at every level pushing in all different directions. And so it's a question of, well, here we've got this big lever that we could use to push change and we're not using it and let's change that. I love it. I love it. Um, I, I can only imagine if, if this is, if you're anyone like, if you're anything like me, I should say, I know we have quite a few people in the room that are watching this. Um, you're either accustomed to this type of messaging, what I'm getting ready to say, or you just naturally think this way, but just, you're passionate about it and you're like, all right, well, what can I do? Right. And I think the natural, or what should I do? And you do get into that, but, um, it's not as easy, and you talk about in the book, as saying, all right, well, shopping, for example, that tends to be the very first thing that comes top of mind. What? Tell me what not to buy. Tell me what product or companies not to support. Um, but in the book, you really sort of frame it as saying, like, it's not uh, just about shopping. It's a lot bigger than that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I could probably talk about at too much length is the efforts that society makes to get us to define ourselves as consumers, mm -hmm. you know, that the point is to consume. And I think folks have probably heard discussions about ethical consumerism or conscious consumerism. I always in my mind put those in quotes, conscious consumerism, mm -hmm. uh, because it's still ultimately, you know, those phrases exist in a consumerist frame. And so they're, they're telling you that the point is to consume when I believe that the more important question to ask is whether to consume and when mm -hmm. to consume. And sometimes, you know, the very best thing we can do, in fact, a lot of the time, the very best thing we can do for both the planet and for people, because so many of our consumer goods rely on exploited labor, people who are underpaid, who are treated badly, in many cases who are forced labor. Uh, you know, there's so much bad stuff that happens that if we're buying a lot of products made by folks in those circumstances, we're contributing to that, we're funding that. And so um, consuming less, first of all, is necessary to meet our climate goals. But but more importantly, it's just that is a big part of the discussion that is almost totally left out when we frame things in consumerist terms. So I think there's that side of it that we can't really, we can't shop our way out of our problems. I, I think about just <laughs> visual aid here. Think about like my clean canteen stainless steel water bottle. Um, a few years ago, it was sort of the thing where like, if you were an environmentalist, you had to own a stainless steel water bottle because plastic single use water bottles are bad. Obviously that's true. Um, but therefore we must need a reusable bottle that we can refill and stainless steel kind of jumped in. Well, it, stainless steel is actually an incredibly resource intensive material. This requires mining iron ore, uh, usually in Australia or Brazil, which are far away from here. Um, and then has to be smelted, which is a coal intensive process. You cannot make steel with solar or wind power. It has mm. to be coal. Uh, maybe in the future that'll change, but we're not there yet. And then when I'm done with this, it is not going to be easy to recycle, even if I pull all these stickers off of it, <laughs> because it's not kind of a standard formulation. And so the idea that we you know, it almost became like a, a signal of, of environmentalism to have the stainless steel bottle. And so many of us did that because we believed that was the right thing when truly the most sustainable option would have been whatever free bottle I already had at home. And we don't think that way. We think like, oh, I'm not supposed to have this thing. So I want this thing instead. But often the answer is not to buy a new thing. It's to use what you already have or not to think in substitution terms. So that's all one part of it. But the other mm -hmm. side, the non-consumerist side, is just that we forget that there are so many decisions we make in life that are fundamentally a financial transaction. I, I say in the book, if if you got paid in cash for every hour that you worked, you know, if every hour your boss walked up to you and handed you cash, you would be very aware that work is a financial transaction. Um, and it would feel very different, I think. Um, but because you get paid through direct deposit for most of us every two weeks, it's easy to forget that that's in fact what's going on. And so work is very much a financial transaction. And that means you have power in who you choose to work for, or if you don't have a lot of choice, which is true for a lot of folks, it's still the power that you have in how you conduct yourself in the workplace, how you fight for things. There are a lot of instances of change happening because customers tried to push for change and it didn't happen, but then employees pushed for change and it did happen. Mm. And so it's 
and understanding and embracing that. It's thinking about where you live and the impact that has on other people, especially for forces like gentrification or nimbyism uh, or, or, you know, lots and lots of issues around housing. There's the question of how you give money, of um, where you save, where you invest. All of that stuff is really important and it's often left out of the conversation. And so I really wanted to bring that into it. That's, you know, sort of saying this isn't about shopping. It, like It is, it is about shopping, but it's also about a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love that because, you know, I, first of all, I, I think, I think it's safe to say that for a lot of people, this is a very uh, intimidating topic, right? And obviously, you know, you mentioned the amount of research that required for you to um, write this book. I mean, there's just a lot to know. It's a lot, you know, and I can imagine that if you're unfamiliar with these things, or if you're just sort of responding uh, to like, uh, let's say it's your community who's sort of calling for these things, or maybe you just kind of have a, a an internal desire to just want to do better. Like, I love that this is a bit of a guideline, a history lesson, but also kind of highlighting why this work is so important, what works, how big it is. Um, I I'm wondering, what do you say to the person who um, who's just very much, for lack, the, the only word I can really think about is just intimidated, right? Um, mm -hmm. What do you say to those people? Uh, and I'm, I'm specifically thinking about the people who are looking for the perfect solution or the perfect balance between living their lives, but also trying to be mindful of how they're spending or consuming and the impact that that's having on the world that we're in. And, and before yeah. you answer, let me let me also say, sorry, I yeah. want to remind people, I should have said this at the beginning, you do have the ability to ask questions. And so there are two uh, sections um, on the site where you can do that. On the right, you can just drop it into the chat box. There's also a button that says, ask a question. And if you click on that, you can drop your questions in there as well. Uh, and then we can ask Tanya those questions. But talk to us, Tanya. What do you say to the people who are trying to, who are likely putting the, the burden of perfection on their shoulders? How do they find the balance? Yeah, first of all, I totally understand. You know, I think it's natural to want to do the very best you can. Uh, but I would really urge folks not to make perfection the goal, I, really in anything, <laughs> like, <laughs> frankly. Uh, but certainly when we're talking about wallet activism, because there is not a person around, okay, maybe like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, those folks, but not counting them, there's no one who can do everything that I talk about in the book. Um, it's simply not feasible to do everything. And more importantly, it's actually not even the goal. The goal, and one of the things we haven't talked about yet, is that to me, this has to be values driven for you. And so we do an exercise early on where I walk you through trying to create a money mission statement that's based on your values and the causes you care most about. And that's because that's going to make this behavior stick more than if you say, well, I'm doing this stuff because Tanya told me to, <laughs> that's that's not gonna last. Uh, you should do it because it connects to your heart and soul and the things you think are important in the world, you know, the, the communities or parts of the, the climate that, that you believe need justice and, you know, where you wanna focus that. So for example, someone who's very focused on climate justice uh, for folks who've been marginalized and oppressed by bad energy policy and all of the other forces that we get into in the book, you're going to make very different, very different decisions than someone who is most focused on racial inequality and shrinking the racial wealth gap. You know, if you care about shrinking the racial wealth gap above all, you might make an effort to spend money at black owned businesses, businesses owned by people of color, indigenous owned, you know, whatever it is that you have available to you versus, you know, someone who's aiming for climate justice, you might be trying to spend as little as possible, totally withdrawing from consumerism and focusing instead on philanthropy. Um, and so those are just two examples. But to me, the goal is, you know, figure out what your values are, what you care most about, and then build a wallet activism plan around that. And a big part of that is so that you can automate a lot of these decisions, because trying to be perfect all the time is just going to exhaust you. Hmm. And that's, you know, like if you think about it, if, if if this feels like a diet and you're trying to live up to some strict rules, you're not going to stick with it. We are not wired mentally to stick with diets. And so this is instead about creating something that's sustainable for you in the sense of meaning like you can do this forever um, and something that feels like it has enough flexibility into it in it that uh, you're not going to throw up your hands and say, ah, I can't do this. I give up. Um, and so 
when it feels like it's coming from your heart, I, I believe that that is easier to do. Uh, but I also think just given the nature of our economy and society, none of us can be perfect all the time. You know, yeah. sometimes you have to make a compromise choice or you need to buy something and, you know, you just don't feel great about that, but, but you do it anyway. That's, I don't want people beating themselves up about that stuff because that is just the nature of the world that we live in. So I think that the biggest thing I would say to folks is start with your most expensive decisions and go from there and think about, okay, where I'm spending the most money, like don't lament the one and $2 choices. If, if those yeah. are even a thing anymore, <laughs> $5 choices, $10 right. choices. New bar. <laughs> yeah. Um, focus on the hundred thousand, ten thousand $10,000 choices, you know, where you live, transportation, how you're earning money, the, the areas where you spend the most focus on that stuff. And then as you develop this skill and you have a more skeptical eye about marketing and what you're told, then you can over time let it expand into other areas of your life. But I think set the bar low for yourself. Don't put a lot of pressure at first. And then just, you know, focus on doing a few things that feel like the right things to start with and build from there. There's so many things swirling around in my head. I spent some time with quite a few of my um, uh, friends who are personal finance enthusiasts this weekend. And we had an entire conversation about uh, really wanting to see much more acceptance uh of lowering the bar <laughs> uh, in, in so many things. And so that is that is like sort of light bulbs are going off in my head there. Um, you're making me think about moments in time where I've really kind of beat myself up. So thank you for that. But I'm also thinking about a friend of mine who works for a company who uh, shall remain nameless, but is, is widely known as, as a villain, quite honestly, in, in many people's eyes. But she has two children and she has a family that supports her. Um, she also burdens herself sometimes with wanting to take a break, but she can't because, well, she can't take any of the recommendations that we offer because quite honestly, she has beef with entire states at this point, right? And so it's very, very difficult for her to kind of try to find this balance. And so I'm certainly going to make um, this book recommendation for her, um, or maybe if I'm feeling generous, I will let her borrow, borrow my copy. We'll see. <laughs> um I have a couple more questions, but um, I want to I want to keep on going off script because that feels a lot better for me. Um, you, you, you're fine. These are low ball yeah, questions. Yeah. Um, I am a big fan of, of fraud um, as a topic. Um, and so I'm wondering, because I know that this book is well researched and feel free to avoid this question if it's, uh, it's uncomfortable. But I'm just curious if in the book you uncovered any um, uh, in any any examples or cases of uh, where let's say, you know, you're talking about, uh, or what I would, would refer to as like the commercialization of some of these issues like social justice or the LGBTQ community. Um, I know often mm -hmm. dealing with corporations, a lot of these things uh, can very quickly uh, look like they are in support of some of these issues, but in many cases aren't. I'm just curious uh, if you stumbled upon anything like that mm -hmm. or or not. Absolutely. You know, I think that there is a tremendous amount of, I don't know that I would use the word fraud, but certainly co-opting of yeah. different causes and using them to try to create, you know, I was going to say earlier when you're talking about working in marketing um, and some of the work that I did in the past could certainly be considered marketing in a certain sense. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with that world. Um, I just tended to do it more for nonprofit organizations and, yeah. and cause-driven ones rather than people selling a product. Um, but the um, the thing that's that's always so funny to me is corporations want us to feel powerless, but then they spend millions of dollars a year on branding ads just to make us feel good about those companies. And so, like, mm. if they're spending that money, they obviously recognize that their reputation matters a ton, that what mm. we think of them matters a ton. Uh, and so it's always been an interesting bit of hypocrisy. So, yes, I think thinking back to a year and a half ago, I'm sure we all remember all of the black squares and the, you know, Black Lives Matter pledges and everything that folks posted on Instagram. And then you go and you look at their their staff and senior leadership and board of directors, and it's just like a bunch of white guys. <laughs> you go like, okay, is this really sincere? Yeah. Um, and that to me is, is a good way to assess a company. I talk in the book about good guy and bad guy companies and how to tell the difference. And there are a whole bunch of different measures. And I, and I honestly think Picking your own set of measures is a really valuable thing. 
And so um, that's something that I really encourage, but that can be a big one. If you see people saying, oh, we care a lot about this cause, but then you don't see them actually doing anything to really live that uh, in their practice, you know, it's pretty easy to say, well, this isn't a company I want to give a lot of money to. Yeah. So um, absolutely. I, I think that that is a rampant problem. I don't think we're going to see the end of that anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that's just, that's what I would say there. That's very helpful um, because that's, you know, I certainly get those questions quite a bit. Uh, and so it's good to know that we can also use this book as a, a measuring stick or at least a guide to help people identify um, what good guy, you know, and, and I love the simple language, good guy. Cause I was thinking that too, but I was like, I gotta find something better. It was like, they're good guys and bad guys. Uh, so I, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that you dig into that. Uh, we do have a quick question, um, and this is good because as I was thinking of a particular friend, as I was saying, who um, you know struggles with finding this balance because she is wants to take a vacation, but she struggles with you know not wanting to go to certain places or even living in certain cities, even though it's likely the most convenient for her. But the specific question came in from Carrie, I believe that's how you say the name, or Carrie. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and the question is, any suggestions for travel? As someone who loves to travel, it's really hard to know if the dollars are going to a good place. It, it's a great question. I have a whole chapter called Being a Good Neighbor. And part of that is very much about travel. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different sides of it. There's the environmental impact of the choices that we make. There is uh, the, the impact on people. And that often has a lot to do with like overcrowding in, um, oh shoot, sorry. I'm having, my computer is dying quickly. So that's where you see me moving around as I'm attempting to plug in while we're talking. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I'm sure everyone understands. I started with 100%, but I think my virus scan is eating it up. Oh, I've been um, there. Yeah, um, but the, the, okay, so there's the environmental impact of the modes of travel. So I know one of the things that people like to talk a lot about is the carbon impact of air travel. Mm -hmm. And that's real, that's significant. You know, right now we have the ability to do all electric cars, all electric um, public transit, many, many for, you know, forms of transportation, but we are not there with air travel and it's not going to happen soon. So that's something that we, we do have to think about is how to, how to cut that. And the biggest way that I propose is to just travel a lot less. You know, this I know is hard to do with our culture of work where you're supposed to take the shortest vacation possible and not very often. Um, but really the best thing you can do from a carbon perspective is to travel less and take longer trips so that you're taking fewer total flights. Mm -hmm. um, and also when you can avoid flying altogether, you should, you know, like if you're flying from Chicago to uh, Florida or something, you could also take a train and that would be unfortunately not quite as pleasant uh, because the U.S. hasn't invested enough in train infrastructure and made it a really wonderful experience. But that is going to be a lot um, better option environmentally than flying, even though it will take longer. Um, yeah. Buses actually surprisingly are the, the most efficient in terms of emissions. And the worst by far, actually worse than flying is cruise ship travel mm -hmm. um, because they use a tremendous amount of energy. You have climate control happening where you're basically air conditioning the outdoors in tropical locations. And uh, cruise travel relies on exploited labor in a way that other um, forms of travel don't. So that's something that's really worth considering is most of the staff on the big cruise lines are people from impoverished nations working for well, well, well below what we would consider, you know, the barest minimum wage. And they're mostly sending that work, you know, that money home. And, uh, you know, it's just a good question of if you want to have an enjoyable vacation on the backs of people from much worse circumstances than you. So I think that's one thing. And then the other, the other question is, are you going to places where you know you're benefiting folks? And I, I think any tourist location that's really overcrowded, um, traveling there, you're putting a lot of burden on the infrastructure that they have that wasn't probably built to sustain as many people as come now. And yeah. a big force for that has been the proliferation of short-term rentals like Airbnb and similar things. Because you used to have a limit in how many people could come into a city based on hotel room capacity that doesn't exist anymore because anyone can rent out their home or buy a property specifically to rent out in short term mm -hmm. ways. So all of that stuff has really kind of thrown a wrench into the whole system. And so it's, it is a good time to think about branching out, visiting places 
and spreading your dollars around a bit more, going to places where people are really trying to build in some economic development, um, ecotourism, that kind of thing, um, as opposed to just, you know, being one more tourist in Rome or <laughs> in Venice uh, or something like that. Wow. Um, thank you for that. I'm certainly having flashbacks to some travel destinations and, and quite honestly, also thinking about my own experiences um, in traveling um, to certain countries and, and being aware of how affordable it is and why it is as affordable as it is in, in most cases, because it comes at the expense of um, low wage workers. Um, so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I want to ask a, another question um, because, you know, we obviously have spoken about how well researched this book is, um, but I'm curious if you could, if you experienced uh, any surprises, right? Was there anything that you just did not anticipate um, finding out that you did and you were shocked by it? Oh my God, goodness. So many things. Um, you know, the stuff that was most surprising was less so the bad corporate behavior kind of stuff, because I, I think um, we all know that a lot of corporate actors do bad things. Yeah. <laughs> so some of that I sort of went like, wow, that's terrible, but not surprising yeah. versus um, I want to just confirm we just got the plug in. So we're all good here <laughs> now. Um, yay. Uh, but some of the stuff that surprised me was actually based on things that we've been told from people who, who would seem to be the good guys on the right side, uh, mm. you know, thinking about, for example, organic food. Um, organic food, I think, has been hailed for a long time by environmentalists as something that we have to switch to. And the truth is that with some things, like with animal agriculture, organic is certainly preferable uh, for a number of reasons, but, you know, not, not the least of which is that non-organic animal products lead to the development of superbugs and antibiotic resistant bacteria that, you know, we've had enough of this pandemic. We do not need more of them. Uh, and so when we have non-organic livestock or milk, eggs, things like that, um, we're, we're contributing to the rise of those pathogens. However, with a lot of different crops, if you think about, you know, with organic food, you need a lot more land to grow the same amount of ultimate food. It often grows more slowly. And some of that's positive. You know, some of it, we're helping to rebuild the soil and sequester carbon in it and do things that are positive. But we're actually using more land when the best thing we can do is leave a lot of land alone so that it can just hold carbon rather than being continually plowed and tilled up and having all that carbon be released. And so when you look at that, you also look at there are greater rates of injuries and chemical exposure among um, farm workers on organic farms, which was just shocking to me. Uh, and I think it's important to know that organic food doesn't mean there's nothing that, that's been sprayed on it. It means mm -hmm. that the stuff that's been sprayed on it was in some way naturally derived. But mm -hmm. as we all know, that doesn't mean good for you. Uh, that doesn't mean totally safe. Um, and so there is a lot about organic um, agriculture that's really not ideal. And in many cases, it's actually better to do things conventionally. What I would frankly love to see is a new standard that's sort of pseudo organic. So it would allow things like nitrogen fertilizer applied in reasonable amounts. So we aren't creating, you know, algae blooms and dead zones in the Gulf and other bodies of water from the excess nitrogen there. But it would ban the toxic herbicides, pesticides, things like that, so that we, you know, because the stuff that's most harmful is the stuff that's sprayed on crops to kill things um, versus the things sprayed on crops or applied in other ways to help them grow. That stuff is really not so bad. And so having a, you know, a big bee in our bonnet about that and not making a distinction between the fertilizers and the pesticides um, is, I think, a mistake. And so we need a bit more nuance in that conversation. But that was a huge surprise to me because I just sort of assumed, like a lot of folks, that organic was always better. And it's just yeah. not the case. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really, really interesting. I'm, I'm not surprised by, by that. Um, I, I've always just sort of suspected that it was one of those things, and I've, I've not studied that um, world uh, in quite some time. But I've always kind of suspected and heard a little bit of rumbling. So I'm really glad that you really dove into it uh, and uncovered some of those things. Um, looks like we have another question. Before we get to it, I just want to remind everyone that there is a coupon right there to save ten percent <laughs> off. If you want to read uh, or purchase this book from Barbara's Bookstore, um, 
Wallet Activism, an amazing book. We're here with Tanya Hester. Um, we have another question here from, well, that's not a name. It's the username, uh, CHGO. Um, are you hearing from any Fortune 500 companies on their willing to change or their willingness to change for the better? So are there good players or people who have, I, I guess, maybe made some pledges and said, you know what, you're right, this is a great point. Um, or these are all great points and we're making sort of commitments to uh, be better stewards in, 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 in any particular area. Did you uncover any of that or have you heard uh, from any major? <laughs> 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 so, what? How could yeah. that be? Well, here's why. So unfortunately, no. And, and there's actually a really good and important reason for it. And for those who know of my work or know of Julian's work, um, in the early retirement financial independence space. Um, the truth is that those of us who are investors are in a way to blame for this because mm. by definition, any company that is publicly traded is accountable to its shareholders and shareholders always prioritize it over long term. Tanya, can you check your your microphone. I'm not sure if it could be that it plugged out just a little bit. I might have bumped it. There How about it now? You're Good. back. Okay. So the the Fortune 500 companies are all beholden to shareholders, and that is, you know, like those of us who are invested in those companies, that's partially our fault. You know, even if it's a big investment bank doing that pushing on our behalf, they're pushing for profits and for dividends. Yeah and keeping the share price high. So they are really motivated to focus on profits above everything else. And that means that the only way to get them to change in a real way is to put pressure on them. And that could be through consumer activism, it could be through boycotts, it could be through employee activism, it could be through um, pushing for regulation so that those companies can't do that business anymore. Um, but often the change does come from within. And I, I mentioned a few minutes ago the, the shareholder activism with Chevron and ExxonMobil, where a few shareholders who weren't large shareholders, they didn't own a ton of the companies, but they started a movement with both companies to install more um, clean energy focused folks on their board of directors so that it'll force the company to go more in that direction. And I think that's a really promising avenue. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I think we still are seeing a lot of commitments that might sound good, uh, but ultimately fall flat. You know, I, I talk about the example of Walmart recently made a new commitment to be um, carbon neutral by, I forget exactly the year, 2030 perhaps. Um, but they said, and this was the first time I'd heard this commitment from a corporate entity, it was they saying they would do that without the use of carbon offsets, which carbon offsets are a highly flawed thing. I talk about that at length in the book. I won't get into it here. Uh, but when you hear people use terms like net zero, that is a good indication that they haven't actually cleaned up their own process, but they've just bought a whole bunch of offsets. And for those who are familiar with the wildfires in the West, I live in California. This was all close to home this year. Uh, we had a huge fire called the Dixie Fire that burned uh, a huge number of acres, but uh, it also burned almost every uh, carbon offset tree planting project uh, that has been planted in this state. So all those offsets, I'm laughing, but it's terrible. All those offsets yeah. are gone now. Um, and so we can't rely on that. But in Walmart's case, so they said they had this commitment without offsets that sounded really good. But then you look at it and it only included their stores. And that's actually a very, very small portion, you know, as big as their stores are and as, as plentiful as they are. That's a small part of their operation, a small part of their emissions. They weren't including their transoceanic shipping. They weren't including the factories that they operate. They weren't including the trucks and trains that are on the road transporting stuff all the time. And so I, I think that we have to really finally tune our consumer antennae to see through those messages and to understand, okay, when they say this, what does that mean? Right now, all the fossil fuel companies are spending a ton to advertise all the good things they're doing. All the banks that fund the fossil fuel companies want you to know about all the, the clean energy projects they're, they're doing. They don't want you to look at the bad stuff and they aren't going to tell you about it. So you have to know, okay, I, I'm sensing that this message is maybe only part of the story. 
Um, but the good news is that that's really doable. That's It's actually just a, a pretty easy mindset shift to remember that if, if someone ultimately is trying to sell you something, they're telling you what they think you need to hear to buy that thing. And that's rarely the full story. Wow. You know, you are really making me think of something that we've always, um, and by we, I mean my wife and I um, on our platform, um, we've always, one of the things we, we realized, and I mentioned that I've worked in marketing before, um, is how much of a life skill I believe it's become. Um, I, I believe, you know, without question that now more than ever, um, marketing has just become a life skill, right? You, you have to sort of know when you're being marketed to, um, which is just becoming increasingly more difficult. Um, a lot of the what people consider to be the news is really just marketing. A lot of these studies that are used to influence our thinking or that are presented to you by um, journalists is really just marketing. Um, so this is really, really helpful. Um, we are getting close to the end. Um, I have one final question for you is, um, what do you want people to take away from this book? That's a pretty standard question but there's and there's a lot so you know if you if you want to i don't want to ask you the one thing so you could feel free to list a few <laughs> things, but what do you what do you really want people to take away from this particular book uh, there is in fact one main thing that i want okay. people to take away from it you know we've spent a lot of time here talking about maybe some of the bad news you know the complication of making a decision in our interconnected economy uh, for those who watch the show, The Good Place, you know, it's very much that thing of no one can, in, can get into the good place anymore because every decision is so fraught. Uh, and and that, that stuff is, well, I, I can't speak to the afterlife, uh, but in this life, uh, we all have complicated decisions in front of us. And, and I know it can feel really discouraging to face that down and say, oh, I just don't know, and throw up your hands, or worse, to throw up your hands and then like go buy a bunch of stuff on Amazon or something. Um, but the thing that I want people to leave with is a feeling that you have power. You know, the the feeling that yes, corporations are huge. Yes, the things that they do are many multiples of what you can do. All of that's true. But I talk a lot about things that you can do that are especially impactful, that are really actually pretty simple, like changing where you bank. If you bank with one of the big banks, um, mm -hmm. is an incredibly powerful act and denies funding to fossil fuel projects and um, conflict mineral mines and factories being built that rely on forced labor and things that it, none of us want to think that our money is funding. But if if you bank with a big bank, it likely is. Um, that's something that is a powerful one-time act, and then you're switched forever, and it's great. So I want you to know that you have power, and I want you to feel clear on how you can use it. The thing that we haven't talked about is um, I think it was really important in wanting to write this book that I wanted to show the full complexity of our choices, show that sometimes the decisions are not simple. In fact, often they're not, but still provide a simplified way of making decisions so that you would feel very clear on like, okay, what can I do? How do I figure this out? And so I give you a set of four questions that we talk about in part one of the book, which is really about becoming a wallet activist, kind of developing a wallet activist mindset. And so I equip you with those four questions to be able to say, okay, here's the decision in front of me. It's not clear what the right choice is. I'm going to think about my values and that mission statement I've created, but also apply these four questions. And I want that to help it feel a bit more straightforward. So you're not constantly feeling like, oh, it's so much work to figure this out. Yeah. And then in the second part, we talk more about kind of the particular subjects like food, what you buy, where you live, and so on. Um, but I, I want folks to, to leave the book feeling inspired and feeling powerful. Wow. Well, I'm certainly going to leave this conversation feeling inspired <laughs> and powerful. Um, and on a personal note, I'm just also just very excited and happy for you. So thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to even have this conversation with you, for sharing this conversation with everyone that's on the room. Uh, thank you to Barbara's Bookstore. I want to hold on for just a second, just in case anyone wants to pop in with any final questions. I think we got to the few that we see here. Um, but if not... Can I say one thing? Sure. I just want to say for everyone listening, um, Julian and Kirsten's blog is really fantastic. Uh, richandregular.com. Please check it out. They are really an incredibly unique voice in personal finance and focusing on the need to, you know, sort of like go beyond the 
the white men and occasionally white women who've been the focus of a lot of finance advice for too long. And their YouTube series, Money on the Table, is really just unparalleled. It's incredibly beautiful. The food looks amazing. I'm always so hungry when I watch it. And um, but the conversations are even better. They they really get into a lot of the emotional sides of money. And so um, that was exactly why, Julian, I wanted to do this with you because I just I respect your work so, so much and I want more people to know about it. And as you sort of said at the beginning, their their new book, Cashing Out, is coming out sometime next year, right? Day yes. TBD. TBD. We're hoping for June, uh, good weather and fun times. So, but thank you so much for that. You're making me wish that I did have a glass of wine or something. That would have <laughs> made it. <laughs> but um, thank you so much um, to, uh, to you, Tanya. Thank you to Barbara's Bookstore. Thank you to everyone that tuned in today. Um, and if you don't have it already, while at Activism, go buy this book. Get it from Barbara's Bookstore. Use the code EVENT to save 10%. Um, and keep in touch with Tanya on her website or all social media platforms. Uh, and tell a friend to tell a friend. Uh, with that, we'll say good evening. Till next time. Bye. Thank you.